This is Rob Nyer. And this is Jim DeFelice. And you are watching the Break It Down show. Happy New Year's Eve, fellas. You too, buddy. Yeah, it's yeah, fun. We're well, going to talk uh, Hall of Fame stuff. Uh, for those that don't know, Rob has written many books on baseball, over a million words on ESPN.com slash MLB, and written in all kinds of places about baseball. And then, of course, Jim is a noted baseball fan, a Yankee fan, a person who is – you've worked for the Yankees in some capacity, at least covering it professionally, right, Jim? Uh, we don't like to talk about that. <laughs> Never that's, mind. That's on, the that's on the down low. Okay. I'm just here. I'm actually just here to ask stupid questions. Perfect. Why don't you start us off? Well, actually, I, you know, I mean, given everything that's happened this past year, I mean, I, I'm just really, really hopeful that, you know, we're going to have baseball back, uh, you know, live with, with fans in the, in the seats this year. I'm just, I'm ready, willing, and you know, just chomping at the bit to go. So, you know, I don't know. I, hopefully you guys are feel the same way. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I have a, 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 a double interest in this because I'd love to be at Safeco Field. Actually, we don't call it that anymore. I think it's now it's T-Mobile Park. But I'd love to be at a Mariners game uh, next summer. Um, I'm also, the, as you guys know, the commissioner of a baseball league. And if we don't play – or we can't have fans, things get a little sticky. So uh, I, I have a, a more than just a rooting interest um, in in seeing baseball uh, next summer in all its its many splendors. And anyone who says they know what's going to happen this spring or summer is either foolish or lying because there are so many unknowables still that um, – most of us, all we can do is hope for the best. So what? Well, what's your gut say, Rob? What uh, What do you think? I honestly, my gut doesn't say anything. I mean, I, I don't trust my gut, um, so I don't even listen to it. Um, not in in when it comes to matters of health and public policy, because the truth is, I don't. In my opinion, this is a little gutty, I guess, but it's also just from sort of paying attention to the way things have been working. Um, I don't think that we can have a normal, anything like a normal season until a huge percentage of Americans have been vaccinated. Uh, and right now it's impossible to know how soon that can happen yeah. because you have, you have a supply issue, you have a logistics issue, and you have a people issue in the sense that a lot of people seem not to want to get vaccinated. And how those three dynamics are going to come together over the next six months, in my opinion, is utterly unknowable. And I would add a complete, uh, a complicating factor to the people issue. We've been so horrible to one another. You know, whatever rank ordering is, is laid out, like there's going to be fights about that. And there's going to be clashes and, and disagreement about that. So even if you want to get it, there won't be enough to get. And that right. will cause like, no, I'm higher priority than you are. Like, you know. So, well, there will yeah, be those I, fights. There's no question about that. Um, um, you know, you've got to ultimately produce enough where those fights either don't happen or they end because enough people have been been vaccinated. We don't know if that's going to happen in April or August. Nobody knows. Yeah. You also have the issue of you know some large percentage. I mean, it's admittedly overall population is still small, but you know some percentage of people have had the virus, and presumably, uh, you know they're not infecting people. Right. So, you know, I don't know. That's another thing. I don't know how the the teams or anybody is going to sort or can sort that out. Um, one ho kind of hopeful thing uh, in New York uh, for the Buffalo. Uh, playoffs for football, uh, they are going to allow fans for the first time, uh, you know, into the stadium. The protocol that they're using that the last I heard, they're going to be testing. You have to have a test uh, a few days before the, uh, you know, the event that they let and they let you in. So I don't know what the logistics are going to be, uh, you know, and, and it's a smaller percentage, obviously, than, than you would ordinarily have at at any football game, let alone a playoff game. So, um, 
you know, it'd be interesting. I hope it goes well. And, but if they're doing that, if they end up doing that for major league baseball games, that'll be, that's another you know, whole issue. Um, right. But, and you know, these are all technical problems that can be solved. Right. You have to have the will and you have to have the financial resources to solve them. But we've seen other countries do some amazing things with, with apps and, uh, and vaccinations and, and tests and, um, uh, you know, nobody's done it on a scale we would be talking about, 330 some million people. But th these are all technically solvable problems. Do we have the will as a people? But we don't know the no. answer to that yet. <laughs> no, no, we don't. <laughs> this is where our diversity is not a blessing. It's a, it causes us, half of us hate us, half of us hate the nation. Half I don't, of us it's not, us. it's not half. I mean, I know you're, all right. you're joking. It's more like 20% yeah. on the extremes on either side. Yeah, don't want to yeah. talk to the, the tens other tens of students. millions of people, you know. Yeah, like absolutely, that. tens of millions, yeah. no question. It's not. Uh, and Brian brings up a good point. And this kind of goes to the overall the the fear and other complicating factors. You know, Brian, Brian's like, I, I can't take my kids to these games because I can't get them a vaccine. You know, because we're not doing it for kids yet. And just in general, do you think? And I guess this question probably is is for you, uh, well, either of you. But I'm thinking about Jim. If if the Yankees say we're going to do 25 percent capacity for fans. Are there even that many fans that would be willing to go? Because you guys have been hammered by it out there in New York City. So would there be enough fans to even show up? That's a good question. I, I think that, um, you know, on the one hand, you know, obviously we're very conscious of the, you know, the effects of the virus because uh, a lot of people have lost, you know, family members, extended or at least extended family members. Uh, on the other hand, you know, there's a pretty big fan base here. The question I would have, uh, okay, so if you're only going to have 25%, you know, who's who's in that 25%? I mean, if you have season tickets, do you get first dibs? Uh, is there some sort of lottery thing? Right. Uh, and then, you know, do, okay, if I do I have to get tested three days before? That might be good for, you know, one game a year or two game or maybe a game a month or something. If, but if you had to do that every every game that you went to, you know, you'd be being tested every other day, practically. So I don't know the logistics. I want it all to work out. Now I'll tell you that, you know, if I have the opportunity, I certainly am. I would be at the first game I can go to uh, and every game I can go to, but you know, maybe there's a, maybe there is a point where, you know, getting a test, you know, getting a stick up your nose or however you're, you know, whatever the late, I guess some of the tests now are a little bit easier. Um, but, uh, you know, do you want to do that every night? I don't know. Well, and, and you do that every night. How do you prove, who do you, where do you get the proof that you tested negative right. and how do you show it to somebody? Yeah. I, I, that's why I think that, and, and, that sort of thing was done. I believe it was in South Korea. I might be wrong. Um, but those were government administered tests. So they could actually send a message to your phone and your app saying he, they, we were, he was officially tested, tested negative. If you're doing a 20 minute test at home, which, are, which mm. these are available now, you can find out for yourself pretty quickly and cheaply. But how do you prove that to someone else? Well, you can't, which is why I really think that ultimately, if we want to get to 100%, in the summer, we've got to ha have a way for people to show that they were vaccinated. Forget about the tests. Um, they were vaccinated. I was vaccinated. Here's my proof on my phone. Let me in. What, 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 what if you've had it? Like, and you've had it in the last three months and you're- Maybe antibody. you can get proof that you have the antibodies. Yeah, yeah maybe that's yeah. another option. Do you bring your test with you? You bring your, you know, the piece, the lab thing that says I was tested, I had yeah, antibodies? That's fine. If it's a lab, yeah. But I think most people are going to are going to steer toward the- the home test because it's cheaper and faster. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if, if my barrier for entry to go to a baseball game is to go to a lab and get in line for two hours or whatever it is, I'm probably not going to, I'm probably going to wait until to go to a game. Until I don't have to do that anymore. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas the vaccination, there are many benefits, but there aren't that, frankly, there aren't that many things that I really need to do in crowds. Going to a baseball game is one of those things, but I don't need a test or a vaccination to, to go to the grocery store right? or the bookstore. Um, it's only these particular situations. And a lot of people, I think, don't want to go to a great deal of extra trouble so they can 
attend these events. M maybe I'm wrong. Young people probably do because they like to go out to bars and whatnot. Um, at my age, I'm pretty content to stay home most of the time. I want to ask you guys, uh, especially Rob, because you, you're a commissioner for an independent league, but this uh, the move by the Major League Baseball to kind of restructure the minor leagues and, and you know, the, the push and pull that's going on with that. What are your guys' thoughts about mm -hmm. how that's going to impact things? I mean, there wasn't even a minor league season last year, and now the major leagues are trying to redefine these things. Is it is it the time to take that on? Should they? I don't know. I have no idea what to even think about this. Well, it's a it's there are so many elements. Um, clearly, MLB would like to control baseball from the very top to the bottom for many reasons. Um, this restructuring, it is obviously shaving the number of MLB affiliated jobs by quite a bit. Uh, most of the players who will lose opportunities in affiliated ball were not going to wind up making the major league. Some would, and and some still will, because the great majority of cities and towns that are losing their teams will still have baseball, whether it's clean summer baseball or independent baseball in the case for example of the most of the pioneer league which is no longer affiliated but it's going to have baseball still um you'll still be able to play baseball if if you were going to in the old system you might not get as much money you might not get the same instruction the same support that you received when you were playing for an affiliated team but um this is mostly about well there's a lot of things but part of it is baseball wants to have a a, a a stronger grip on the development pipeline for the players that they have deemed the most likely to make the major leagues. And they're certainly going to accomplish that. Does that, is that, I know that that's their goal, but you know, it, it seems to me, you know, as you cut down on the, you know, this obviously is going to have some sort of adverse effect on, on the league, on certainly on independence and in, in the minor league system, does it? I'm wondering if it's going to have any effect on the you know the product that we see on the field. If we're not going to, uh, you know, we're going to get the reverse that we won't get um, players as developed as you know as we've been privileged really to see. Well, Jim, I mean, it's a it's a valid question. It's all theoretical at this point, right? Nobody knows what this is going to look like. What I think that maybe not Rob Manford would argue, I don't know what if he's thought too deeply about this, but I think what player development people within the game would probably argue, the consensus anyway, would be that we're going to have fewer players in our in our system, but we will, because we have more control, because we have on balance, better facilities because we have uh, fewer 12 hour bus trips. These players will, will have a, it will be somewhat easier for them to develop and to learn these new skills. And they'll have the technology available all the time and they'll have better um, training facilities in the ballparks that, that are still, still around. They'll have better nutrition. MLB is going to, or, MLB is mandated. I think that players are going to be paid more minor league players, which I think is a good thing given some of the horror mm -hmm. stories we've heard about players subsisting on fast food and living four to an apartment and not getting enough sleep, et cetera. So I think they would argue that the players who do come up through the system will, will be better. will 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 uh, be able to train better, et cetera. We will miss out on some talent. No question. There are going to be some players who don't want to go to, uh, the Pioneer League with an unaffiliated team or, right. or an independent team and and then try to work their way up. Um, and some of those guys would have been major leaguers, no question. There will be some talent lost for sure. Bob, is this something is this an opportunity for the independent leagues? I mean, as as the MLB clamps down, there's going to be, you know, the ability for higher level independent leagues, all kinds of things. And then do you guys just partner with driveline? You know they're a sort of local company, right. and just say, hey, let's let's invest in these players, and then like the olden days, just sell them to the major league programs and say we've got we've got this you know 
undrafted guy that's been through the whole driveline program. He's been through two years of our league play. Uh, we'll take $2 million and you guys can put him in whatever level you want. Well, what I would say is that, first of all, I should be clear. Um, my league is a collegiate summer league, so we don't sell, we can't sell players to anybody. It's, they just go back to school after our season. But you're, 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 I think it's true that, and by the way, we would like to work with Driveline and hope to uh, this year or uh, this next season. But it is true that independence does bring opportunities. All of a sudden, your roster is not determined by those guys over in New York or Miami, or wherever it is. Your roster is determined by how well you can go out and find good players, right? And if I'm marketing my team, you know, typically you have a couple of options. You can either market yourself as, hey, look at these guys. They're going to be in the major league someday. That's the traditional sort of minor league model, right? At least in terms of talent. I think it would be a lot more fun. And if you do it correctly, more successful to say, hey, come and look at our players. We have the best players. We're going to win the most games and bring a, a, a championship to your city, right? Mm -hmm. And teams did that before. You know, the, the Hillsboro Hops, which is the nearest uh, affiliated minor league team to, to where I live in Portland, um, they go to the playoffs every year and they promote the hell out of that. Um, do their fans care? I don't know. Probably a little bit, but I think it means more when winning baseball games is prioritized above player development. As a fan, I would be more interested in that, but I'm also probably not a typical fan. And do you have a sense for how many players are non-traditional in their timeline and approach? I mean, you know, Jamie Moyer isn't any good until he's like 28 years old. There's players that just take longer or or they go to the Mexican lead and they learn the super deep, dark uh, changeup that makes them from a catcher into a, you know, a viable pitcher. I mean, these things do happen. Independent leagues do produce players. Is there a number and, and is, is MLB, I mean, are they working from this kind of approach? Like, look, we're going to lose 10% of these players that are non-traditional, but we're fine with that because we're going to save you know, this and get these other benefits. How can you know how many you would lose though? Because these guys <laughs> will actually have more opportunities. Randy Dobnek, for example, who pitches for the twins and has put up some nice numbers. He, I just saw something just yesterday. He came from some, he came from the United shore baseball league, which is a 14 league that plays out of one ballpark in the Detroit metropolitan area. I think he's the only major leaguer so far that came out of that league. Well, there are going to be a lot more leagues like that, more opportunities like that, with all these places losing their affiliations. Um, does that mean – so the Rand, Randy Dobnacks of the world theoretically have more opportunities now to play baseball somewhere and develop their talents and show the scouts what they can do. So um, – I actually think that that I don't know who you lose. You're going to lose some people who won't get drafted anymore. By the way, the draft is going to be much smaller in future years. I think it's going to be 10 rounds, 10 or 20, where it used to be 40 or 50 or even 60. Yeah. So how many of those guys who would have been drafted in the 24th round now don't get drafted and say, you know what? If I'm not even good enough to get drafted, I'm just going to quit baseball. Yes, I could go play in the Pioneer League or I could play in the United Shore League. But I'd rather go get a job doing whatever. It's going to pay better, um, and I have a better future there. So who knows? We don't know how many of those guys are going to be lost. Can't know. Or, or just pick baseball or, or basketball or football instead. You know, right. Frank Thomas now says, hey, forget it. I'm going to go do something else. How about right. Mike Piazza? He becomes a plumber or something. Well, Mike Piazza's father was a billionaire, as I recall. So I don't think that was ever really an option for him. <laughs> That's probably true. Uh should we talk about the Hall of Fame a little bit? Sure. Jim, what are your um, what are your thoughts on this class? Did you work through a ballot at all, or do you have any favorites? I I'm not a I'm not a, a voter or associated with anything. I'm just a guy with crappy opinions. So uh, <laughs> I, I think um, you know I, I I think you know just looking at last year's holdovers, um, you know Schilling seems to be kind of the favorite to you know 
to come in this year and speaking as a Yankee fan, um, you know, remembering that stupendous, <laughs> kills me to say, that stupendous performance he had uh, in the playoffs against the Yankees based on that one game, uh, you know, he definitely, I would have to say, and you could, ha- you could put a gun to my head, I would have to admit that he belongs in the Hall of Fame just based on that game. Um, I don't know that that's really a valid uh, criteria for anybody uh, getting into uh, getting into the Hall. But, um, uh, you know, o- outside of him, the, I-, I think he's, you know, clearly the, the you know, the traditional favorite. Uh, the big question I have would be, you know, does Roger Clemens and Barry Bonds, uh, do they get in? Because they have, if we took the, if we took the, obviously the big issue of steroids off the table, they would certainly have been in, you know, a couple of rounds ago. I forget. Uh, I think they're on number, uh, is their eighth time maybe or seventh. Um, so, you know, so I mean, that's going to be a big issue with, with a lot of voters, I would imagine. Yeah. The, the, uh, the question on Schilling, let me ask you this, Rob, this is an interesting point that, that Jim brings up, you know, that bloody sock game, is that comparable to a playoff no hitter? I mean, is this something that like, cause these things define careers, right? You know, um, who, whatever, you know, Halliday has a no-hitter. Don Larson's always known for his no-hitter. Is this comparable to that? Well, I think that, sure. Short answer is yes. It it, it, it falls under the heading of legendary postseason performances. The Hall of Fame voters have typically not been mm. particularly swayed by the postseason. And, you know, the one counterexample would be Jack Morris, right? Who perhaps wouldn't have been elected without his game seven, I believe it was a shutout, 10 inning shutout um, against the Braves. Having said that, he also needed, I think what got him in was that and also being the winningest pitcher in the 1980s. He needed two hooks, essentially. Um, If you don't have the overwhelming numbers, you need... You need a hook, um, or you often need a hook. And Moore had two because his other numbers, his ERA, was not all that impressive to name just one. Um, he didn't win a Cy Young Award. Not, I don't think he did, but he did have those hooks. And I think that's what got him in ultimately. Uh, Schilling is underrated, believe it or not. Wow. I mean, if you look at his just regular season wins above replacement, I'm not saying they're the be all end all, but. Fantastic, right? And then look at the body of his postseason work. And for me, postseason play is a great tiebreaker. If someone's sort of on the on the line, which a lot of players are, I think postseason performance is a is a tiebreaker. Uh, and Schilling is fantastic, not just that one game. So to me, his postseason performance elevates him well beyond. Um, Leaving out the the other baggage, um, mm-hmm. it elevates him well above any line that I would draw if I were voting. Yeah, and, and not <laughs> he certainly doesn't need me pushing his candidacy. But his, if you look at uh, you know the, the overall in his career, I think his walks and, and hits uh, per inning is very impressive. Um, you know, so I, I, which I don't know if this is really the time to get into, but you know, there's always been kind of a debate. I remember reading this in actually, I think it was Bill James' historic abstract back. Uh, well, that's got to be in the '90s or so, or maybe late '80s when that came out. The first one, yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, talking about you know, do you evaluate a player based on, uh, you know, peak season or peak performances versus, you know, their overall career? Um, yeah, and I'd say there's not, there's not a right answer there, right? Yeah, right. If you, yeah, go, to, if you go to baseballreference.com, you can see Jay Jaffe's mm-hmm. uh, metric jaws, which, uh, and what he does, among the things he does is look at, uh, you know, peak seasons 
or top seven seasons. I know Baseball Reference lists those too. That, and that's utterly arbitrary. You're picking seven or five. I, I think that I think uh, Ryan Kenny likes to look at a player's eight best his mm-hmm. his best eight season run. Why eight, Brian? I mean, I love Brian. Don't get me wrong, but it's arbitrary. Um, there's there's you could look at whether or not those things, the eights or the sevens conforms to the existing standards. I don't think that, that it does. It's just something that people think seem to think is reasonable, which it is, but what about nine? Are you okay with nine? What about six? Dale Murphy had an amazing six right. season run. So I don't think there's a right answer there. I like to look at, you know, Bill James once said, speaking of Bill, uh, just sort of tossed off this comment where he, about evaluating players and he said everything counts and that's kind of what i how i try to look at it it all counts for me six eight ten twenty show me everything and then let me sort it out what what about a guy like uh i think uh like tim hudson for instance i think he you know he was um he pitched what about 17 seasons some you know uh, you know his longevity should longevity you know be something that you that you factor into yeah and i'm looking at him right now and he's one of those guys who definitely is borderline you know he's got a mm-hmm. tremendous winning percentage yeah. 22 and 133 106 25 winning percentage which is fantastic well above i suspect most hall of famers he also pitched for really good teams um he never won a Cy Young, but was in the top five four times um mm-hmm. You know his postseason record is good, but not by by no means great. He won one postseason game in his career, so uh, he's one. Of, he's the sort of guy who I would probably have a tough time voting for in the first ballot. Not because I think that 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 there's a difference between first and second ballot guys. That's I've always thought that was silly. I just think that uh, the more time you have to study a candidacy, the better off you are. And if somebody's on the borderline for me i'd probably hold off and give it some more thought the next year because um you know our 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 perceptions our knowledge does change um over over the years the context too right like so so mike petriello did a great piece on mlb.com everybody check that out and he talked about there's um you know, like like certain positions get lost, and now it looks like certain eras of positions get lost. So third basemen have long suffered from – they're sort of tweeners. They're not quite shortstops. They're not, you're not quite, you know, first baseman or whatever, and so they, they look weird. Uh, and now it appears that pitchers look really weird. We're trying to determine what a great pitcher is. I think Tim Hudson might look a lot better in 20 years when we know what greatness looks like for this era. Right. Yep. Johan Santana. And I, I, again, Cone, Wells, Hershiser, these guys were – incredible pitchers we're probably going to have to continue to deal with their their credentials and then i wanted to bring up andy pettit and ask jim specifically does he seem like a hall of famer to you because on that team a hall of uh, you just uh, the yankees stable of hall of famers it's like eh, andy pettit you know he might play on a hall of fame team for the yankees but maybe not okay <laughs> put me on the spot here um i i think andy uh, Andy was a great pitcher. For me, Andy is just a guy that's just on the borderline of you know of being in the Hall of Fame. Uh, on the other hand, if I had, I have to admit, if I wanted a pitcher, if I really had to win that 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 game in the uh, you know in the series, I'd want Andy Pettit. Um, so fortunately, I don't I don't have a vote. <laughs> but no, I think I, I I love Andy Pennant, and and now I will get bombarded by every Yankee fan I know, and probably not be allowed in into the stadium. But I think he's I think he's a borderline was a great pitcher, but you know the Hall of Fame should be reserved for just that next level. The difference between if you had to ask who would you prefer on the team, and I you know as a who would you prefer watching you when you everything's on the line you would i would go with clemens over over pettit i gotta be honest 
Um, and now probably will not be allowed in anywhere near the Bronx. I mean, to be well, fair, Clemens is basically the best pitcher for the last hundred years. You want to pick a different guy, great, but Clemens is the next guy. I mean, so it's okay to, to pick Clemens. You shouldn't feel bad about that. And, and by the way, I, I'd like somebody to sh- – you're, you're right about starting pitching. We don't know yet. We haven't sorted that this era out really. But in many ways, there's almost no difference between – in terms of how dominant they were and for how long between Andy Pettit and Tim Hudson and Mark Burley. They're all roughly the same, again, roughly. And Pettit, of course, gets a big bump because he won 19 postseason games. Um, His ERA in the postseason, was it better than his regular season ERA? Um, A little bit, but not. it was basically the same performance. Now he's, he's facing better opponents, so great. If we're gonna, I think we could elevate Pettit above Hudson and Burley because of his postseason performance. The question is, how much is that enough? And I, I don't know the answer, but I agree with Jim that he's he's certainly borderline. But which side of the border? We all get to decide. Yeah, I, I and I have to say, I would elevate him against uh, over those two pitchers. Just to, mm-hmm. now, now I can go into the Bronx. I can't get in the stadium. <laughs> but I in the Bronx. I like to think of players like being 10% or 20% better. You know, like Gary Sheffield's like almost as good as Barry Bonds in a lot of ways, right? So is there enough energy to get him above the line? Mike Mussina goes into the Hall of Fame fairly easily, but to differentiate with all these pitchers between, you know, Mike Mussina and those guys, there's not a lot of difference. I mean, is there even 10% difference in terms I, of I, I, had, I had Mussina quite a bit better. Okay, yeah, I, I would agree with that. It is, you know, the thing with Messina, you got to remember he, he pitched for Baltimore for so long. And uh, with all due respect to my my friends in Baltimore, uh, <laughs> he was a he was a hell of a pitcher throughout his career, not just with the Yankees. So, is Mike Messina a no doubt about her? And if he is, isn't there room below him for a guy like Pettit or? Hudson. And I mean, especially Burley. Burley left with, with a lot of energy left in his career. Well, I would say that Mussina wasn't a no-doubter. I think he took him three or four or five tries to make it, right? So yeah. he might have been no-doubter to me and to you, but to the voters, bizarrely, in my opinion, he wasn't a no-doubter. He was, for many voters, a borderline choice. Um, and if he's borderline, what does that make those other guys you mentioned? Mm, yeah. But having said that, if you look at the history of the Hall of Fame and the voting, you see some very strange things. You see players who get 10% their first ballot and then 10 years later get 78%. What changed? Um, I talked about perceptions changing and, and, and knowledge. It changed that much? So players build momentum on the ballot for whatever reasons. Um, so I, I could certainly see Hudson and, and Pettit and, and even Burley down the road building more and more support. Um, but there is a significant gap between them and Mussina, who was considered borderline by a lot of voters. There's also the thing, uh, you know, the way that the ballot works, um, you know, when you have certain players on there, uh, you know, everybody's going to, you know, a certain number of votes. You can only vote for a certain percentage anyway. You can vote for 10. Uh, yep. you know, so, you know, everybody's going to vote for Jeter right. uh, last year. And, um, you know, so maybe that knocked and maybe that's one other factor. Uh, that absolutely maybe. happens. Yep. So no question. It, it, Rob, is there room? I mean, you've, you've had a, a hall of fame, but I, I believe you had, right? Like you I had haven't. No, I, I wasn't. I think I fell way short of the number of years, oh, okay. membership years in the BBWA to get a ballot. So if you had a ballot and you were going to vote and someone like Jeter is on there, do you, have a problem with someone saying, Hey, I know Jeter's going to breeze in. He doesn't need to be unanimous, but I do want to make sure we're still continu- continuing to consider, you know, Kenny Lofton or Johan Santana. Is it okay right. to, to kick a vote back to the back of the pack since it is so crowded or it has been until recently? My personal opinion is that it's perfectly acceptable to, I, there's somebody came up with a name for, for that. Um, I absolutely would have considered it if I thought when, if there were 10 deserving players aside from Derek Jeter, absolutely, I would consider leaving him off. The problem, and I know that, that I know Sean Foreman wrote, talked about this. Sean Foreman discussed not 
voting for Jeter. Ultimately, he voted for him purely because he didn't want to deal with the the vitriol that he would have received publicly. <laughs> right. Um, and I, which I totally sympathize with. I don't know if I would have had the courage to leave Jeter off the ballot. Um, now you could just keep your ballot private, but there is a a most of the younger voters, especially I think, um, want to be open about their ballot so they can talk about it and 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 they want the process to be public, which I think is is uh, it's it's healthy. But there are some advantages to keeping your ballot secret, and one of them was would be to make decisions like that without having to worry about being crushed by idiots. <laughs> One of the one of the guys that got elected recently, but took him a long time, was was Tim Raines, and there was an argument. I think Jason Stark made it, but it might have been Posnanski that made it. But basically, he said Tim Raines got to first base more than Tony Gwynn did, and it was That's like, right. oh, yeah. oh shoot, I didn't. Re and like, there's that one moment, like super clarity, like of course, because Tim Raines wasn't quite as good as Ricky Henderson. He wasn't a superpower. You know, he had these things where he wasn't quite enough, and then you realize, wow. I mean, Tony Gwynn, he's a legend. Tim Raines must be good. Well, there's also the thing on what media, you know, what media market he's playing in. Um, you know, if so, yes, he's he's playing at the same time when Ricky Henderson is. But, um, you know, there's no doubt that, you know, certain markets, you know, they get a lot more publicity, not just in the home market. You know, if you, I, I think that, you know, if you vote for, if you play rather for the Yankees, you're going to get, or, or the Dodgers, you know, you're going to get more attention um, than you would get, you know, in Minnesota, say. Well, and I talked about hooks before. Reigns didn't have a hook. Yeah. It's, it could have been best leadoff man in baseball. Sorry, Ricky Henderson's got that one. Yeah. Could have been best base dealer in the National League. Well, he got that for a couple of years, but then all of a sudden, here's here's Vince Coleman. Right. Mm -hmm. And the other problem that, that that Reigns had was that he his game completely changed the last eight or ten years of his career when he was still effective because he got on base all the time, but he wasn't stealing 60, 80 bases. So uh, Hall of Fame voters have typically not been kind to players with long tails on their career where they weren't in the all-star game every year where they weren't um, MVP candidates, but you look at the body of work and of course Reigns deserved to be in long before he was, you know, I, I could see the argument against him, but people weren't making that argument. They just seemed to sort of forget him. And it took a lot of work from, you know, Jonah Carey did an immense amount of work to keep Reigns' name out there in front of the voters and make mm -hmm. the case for him. And others did as well. And I believe Reigns made it in his last year. It might have been his next to last year, yeah, but um, right. clearly, he clearly deserving. Little, he but you mentioned you, you mentioned Kenny Lofton on him a little bit too. That went back when that mattered, you know, a long time right. ago, with cocaine and all that other kind of stuff. And that, that that matters, but it did back then. Well, I don't know. I mean, a lot of um, Reigns was better known for cocaine than some other players. But Paul Molitor, for example, nobody brought up cocaine when Paul Molitor was a nope. Hall of Fame <laughs> candidate. Didn't even come up, so, um, and, and he had some significant issues. Um, so, uh, you know, the, 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 a lot of selective things happen, and it's difficult to predict to understand why. But, um, but um, drug use was never held against any player, really, until the steroid era. You could argue that might might have cost Reigns a few votes, but I really don't think that was that had much to do with it. I, I think that you know, kind of the explosion over the last decade or so in the availability of statistics, and um, you know, you basically you can get almost any statistic you want, almost any statistic you want. I think that has helped, you know, build you know in terms of building support for you know for different players you know over over time. Um, I don't know. I'm wondering though if there's uh, if there are any examples where it's hurt, where it's hurt uh, people. I, that's a good question. I've never thought about that, Jim. But I, I think you're probably right. I mean, there were players elected decades ago who had did not have impressive statistical resumes, but nobody really paid attention to that stuff. And that, I mean, with the exception of Harold Baines, that really hasn't happened in quite a while. We talked about this before, but I want to bring it up, Rob. I think it, 
it's worth repeating in case someone hasn't heard one of the other conversations. Harold Baines, we looked down on that decision, but if you take the strikes that he did as he fought with the union to try to get more rights for players, which all players now stand on their those guys are sacrificing their shoulders. If he doesn't get the 3,000 hits, he's probably north of 2,900. And there's a lot of players that get credit for World War II <clears throat> service. It's a different form of service. Johnny Damon, Al Oliver, these guys that get to within, I mean, a hair's, I mean, a season, maybe that. And then you throw in strikes. Are we being too hard on these guys? Well, I, again, I, I think everything counts. Um, there are certainly players in the Hall of Fame because they collected a large number of hits and didn't do a great deal else. They tend to be players from the 1920s and 30s not the 80s and 90s. Veda Pinson is a guy who came, I think, roughly a season short of 3,000 hits. Um, Not many people argue for him as a Hall of Famer. He probably was a better player on balance, did more to help his teams win than Baines did or Johnny Damon did. Um, So I don't know. Look, we can talk about the technical parts of the Hall of Fame and wins above replacement and, and why... You're going to vote for Kurt Schilling, and maybe I'm not. But on a philosophical level, the question I would always ask if I were voting about a player is, not is this player better than some guys in the Hall of Fame, because that's true of hundreds of players. Uh, The question I would ask is, does this player, as near as I can tell, does he raise or at least maintain the current standards of the institution because to me as a voter what you're doing is you're serving the institution not the candidates themselves not yourself the institution and so in in the case of uh baines is a tough one because he was a dh but there aren't many of those in there but in the case of a you know a starting pitcher or a shortstop i'm going to look at all the guys in there at that position and i'm going to say to myself is he better than at least half of these guys because if he's not, I'm lowering the standards by voting for him, not maintaining them. And uh, that's sort of my baseline for everybody. I don't think Beta Pinson, for example, um, I, I doubt if he would raise or maintain the standards for Hall of Fame center fielders. I could be wrong. I haven't looked at Pinson in a long time, but that's that's how I think about these things typically. What if that position is? Oh, sorry, Jim. You go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. You were going to follow up. I was going to say, um, what about what about the positional problem of like, hey, third base is really hard, or you know, some other aspect that's not accounted for. I mean, is there? Are you lowering the bar if you're trying to get these guys up to the standard of? of no, the that, that's a the third baseman discussion is is really interesting. Yeah, uh, because they're for for many years, Hall of Fame voters had no idea what they were doing when it came to third baseman. <laughs> It took Eddie Matthews, who was at the time the best third baseman who ever played, it took him years to get in. Why? Nobody. Yeah. It took Ron Santo, who was probably, when he retired, top five all time. Mm. It took him 25 or 30 years to get into the Hall of Fame. And Why? he had to be dead to get there. He was dead to get there, right. So yeah. um, third base is all, Scott Rowland is another great example, mm. who's on the ballot now. And in my mind, is well-deserving. Um probably raises the standards for the position at least maintains them he's gonna have a tough time uh because roland two of his attributes great defense and getting on base are underappreciated by hall of fame voters still today not as much as they used to be but they still are so third base is tough um you can make arguments for ken boyer and and greg nettles and probably buddy bell um um just to sort of lift the numbers for third baseman to maybe where they should be. But that's a special case. I think for the most, if you look at the other positions, they're pretty, they're pretty evenly balanced in terms of the overall numbers. Well, I, I think defense, I, that that's a good point. I mean, it's even with, you know, even with some of the advances in terms of measuring, you know, d- defense these days, it's still very, very hard to, uh, you know, really evaluate that. And yeah, you know, you can say, well, this player, you know, I, I know they're a good defensive player and their metrics kind of bear that out, but it's rare. I mean, how many players have gotten into the hall of fame primarily because they're, you know, they're 
we're in for defensive purposes. Five or six, maybe. Yeah. I mean, you, I would say certainly uh, uh, Mazeroski. That's right? one. Dave yeah. Bancroft, um, who's a shouldn't be in. Uh, Robert Moranville, who's marginal. Um, um, that's about it. There really aren't many at all who are there primarily. Ozzy Smith, obviously, although he a better hitter than than maybe people, people give him credit for. Brooks but Robinson, Ozzy's in because of his primarily defense. For his glove? Who? Brooks Robinson is he there primarily for his glove? I think he would have made it even as an average third baseman because of his longevity. Um, but you might maybe. I mean, yeah. well, but he he probably lasted longer in the lineup because of his glove, which allowed him to pile up those numbers. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he probably. He probably goes in that group. The steroid issue is still being sorted out. Uh, again, you we guys like Jaffe and other people, they talk about if C League is in, then you know we have to relook at these steroid guys. So Clemens, Bonds, Sheffield, you know, Poppy's coming up. All, you know, all these players have this thing to deal with. And, and I guess I would say before I shut up, you know, when Bonds is facing people, he's facing Todd Stottlemyre. Sorry, Yankees fan. Sorry, Jim, who's like, I'm blew up my rotator cuff. I just got my whole body strong. And then he showed up way bigger and you're like, come on. So he's facing guys who are doing it. If, if the field is played at that level, not that everybody was, but it seems like we can't quite be so hard on these guys anymore. I think that we like to think of not just baseball players, but people as you know, I'll just speak about men for a second because I, I know them better probably. Bad guys and good guys. He's a good guy. He's a bad guy. You know, um, we we sort people out that way. But the truth is that most of the things that people do, at least publicly, are a result of their culture. And the culture in baseball was to use drugs. Like it or not, it was. Now, were there players who wanted nothing to do with drugs? Absolutely. Just like when you've got a crooked police department, uh, there are good cops in those police departments. Um, When you've got a crooked, whatever it is, uh, service workers union. You know, I remember, I always, I always think about this. There was a story six or eight years ago about a, 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 a public employees union. I believe it was someplace near New York. Jim, you probably remember this. I think it might've been on Long Island. And like 90 some percent of the members of this this union had retired because of disability. And when some reporters went out and looked around, they found that these people were all playing golf and uh, doing deadlifting and you know skydiving on disability. You remember this, Jim? Uh, yeah. These weren't all bad <laughs> <New> people. <York. laughs> these weren't all bad people is my point. It was mm-hmm. that, it, that for, however it happened, that became the culture and mm-hmm. we just tend to go along with whatever the culture is around us. And that was the culture in baseball. So it's, it's hard for me to be too judgmental about the players of the nineties when everything around them was saying, Hey, this is what we're doing now. We're putting this in our bodies and we're gaining 30 pounds and hitting the ball 500 feet or throwing 96. That's what we do. Mm-hmm. Um, we all like to think that we would have the character to resist becoming a part of that. Um, I'm not that confident in my character. Um, <laughs> so it's same. hard for me to be, ju- it's hard for me to be, for me to be judgmental. Yeah. Yeah. And especially when it's something that you can do to make yourself better at your job or your yes. game. And, right. um, you know, I just, you know, I just think that Barry Bonds, you know, just his his what he did in baseball, he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame on those numbers. Um, and you could certainly make an argument that he was great before, even before, you know. And the same thing with Clemens. And the same thing with the Clemens. bodies of work are just overwhelming. And and guys. as Rob says, you know, there were other players, a lot of other players. It's just that those guys um, stand out for whatever reason they stand out. Now, if you want to, if you want to take a player like Mark McGuire, uh, if let's assume that that you think he's a borderline candidate based on just the numbers, which I would argue that perhaps he is. He did a couple of things really well. Drew walks, hit home runs, didn't do much else. 
to help his teams win. If you want to use drugs or uh, telling fibs in in a congressional hearing as a tiebreaker, I, I'm not going to tell you you're wrong and shouldn't do that. Um, but Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens, this isn't a tiebreaker situation. Mm -hmm. These are utterly dominant players, drugs or no drugs. Um, and generally speaking, the Hall of Fame uh, has never been about character. We might like it to be, yeah, but it never has been. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. Star and and you could and whoever you want to pick. I mean, Babe Ruth for crying out loud. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, like, who was a character, a great character. Uh, so yeah, to to that point, absolutely. When we look at the steroid thing too, I'm always like a like you, Rob. I, I you know, it's hard for me to be too judgmental of somebody because I don't know if there was a pill that would make authors thirty percent better. I'm on. Dude, give it, give it. Done. <laughs> right, actually, yeah, coffee, right? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I have. I mean, here's the thing. What I would probably say is I, I'll take that pill, but only until I, for the three months, I need to finish this book, right? But then the next book comes along, right? Yeah. And how do you resist that one? So, I mean, I, I get it. I, I really do. Um, well, and, and, but, and with that pill, though, comes greater sales. I mean, greater the next contract is better right and so you're just like chugging these pills down you know and then if you were if you're stephen king and you're not worried about selling books and somebody starts crushing you you're like well <laughs> like, well especially because um it, it, people probably a lot of fans like to think that players took drugs at least in part because they were motivated by money and sure there's some of that but most of these guys are in intensely competitive and mm. want to win games more they want to be the best player they can be and, and and be better than the guy over here i know there was a there was a survey years and years ago where olympic athletes were asked and these were not professionals for the most part were asked if you could uh take a pill that would guarantee a gold medal but would you know, take would would take 10 years off your life would you do it and 90 some percent of them said they would sure wasn't about the money. It was about reaching this thing that they've been trying to reach for who knows how many years. And players are not immune. Baseball players are not immune to that. Those, 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 those feelings. Yeah. And I think, and not to, not to beat it, not to beat a dead horse here, but I, I think that, you know, the, now there's a, you know, now there's a feeling that, you know, that you don't use drugs, that, you know, there's testing and stuff. So I think that, you know, I think we're in a, a somewhat different period now than, um, you know, than they were, or at least that they were in when they started using them. Right. Oh, absolutely. I, I, no doubt about that. And, you know, intelligent fans, and hopefully we're all intelligent fans. Uh, you know, you go and you look at who's in the Hall of Fame and you understand that that they're from different eras and, you know, somebody from the dead ball era, you know, they had, you know, the game was different then. The game was different in the in the 80s and the 90s uh, than it is now in, in the 20s. I, I, I would say that the, the one thing that that gives me pause during these conversations is that if we assume that steroids were a performance enhancer. And I, I, there are people who think that they weren't. I don't believe that. Joe Sheehan seems to believe it. Um, and I, Joe Sheehan's a really smart guy, and I'd, I would never dismiss his, his opinions out of hand. But let's assume for a moment that they were performance enhancing. Um, we, are, we do have to face the conundrum of what to do with players who didn't use drugs, mm -hmm. right? Um, if we, the problem is, of course, that we don't know that Fred McGriff didn't use drugs. Should we take him for his word? Uh, you can. I don't know that we should take anyone at their word necessarily. You know, Ken Griffey Jr. Did he take drugs? Everybody says no. How can I know? I'm not right. that smart. But certainly, if a if we assume that steroids helped, and b we assume that Fred McGriff didn't use them. We're talking about a 550, 600 home run guy now who, mm -hmm. if he had used drugs, and he'd be in the Hall of Fame. Are we being fair to him? I don't know. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the, the other thing about the drugs is the w- typically the way that they work is that they enable you to do other things and recover from them uh, quicker, right. uh, weight training or you know or what have you. So right. it's not like oh you just pop this magic pill and and now you're this fantastic baseball player. And you right. can see that in Bond's career, for instance. Yep. Um, you know they didn't just uh, you know go out to Dunkin' Donuts, have a couple of dozen donuts and, you know, and, and have a steroid in, in, you know, in between there. Um, And there's been a lot of advances in terms of nutrition now and, and just general training and stuff that also will make a difference. Um, And those are allowed. One of the things we've seen, by the way, is the, not the demise, but the, the near demise of older players, especially position players, mm-hmm. having dominant seasons, which we saw a great number of right. in the 90s. Players mm-hmm. in their late 30s, early 40s, putting together these big numbers. And that's kind of gone away, which is an argument for the effectiveness of sports drugs, um, at least the the one, the, 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 the banned sports drugs. Um, so I don't think that we still, we yet have a full accounting of what the drugs did to the numbers in that era. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the other thing too about the drug thing, and I always like to bring this up because it's an important point, things that you can do to your body legally in baseball, you can have someone run a drill up and down the joint of ball of your, of your hip to recondition it. You can literally perforate your hip. You can go and get stem cells injected into your body. You can have your cornea swapped out or carved on by a laser. You can have a rib removed to, to improve your thoracic outlets condition. You can do any number of things. You can take a dead person's body part and put it in your body in mm-hmm. a number of areas. And all of that is not performance enhancing. And so at some point it's like, hey, you know, if science is going to be like I I would consider like a formula one kind of model. Like if you want to build a super player, these guys are at the elite level, nothing below that, but you know, I'd be interested in in doing that because at some point you can be able to sign people are going to be, I mean, we're approaching gene engineering at this point. And and bionics, right? We have the the technology. You guys are all done to remember Steve Austin. Yeah. Uh, Probably. Maybe you're not. He'd be a deal. Pardon me? Six million dollars. Yeah. I remember. Um, but you know, we're, we're, there's never going to be a moment when we say, "Oh, today's when the bio- bionic guy came uh, arrived." We're just work, right. we're slowly working toward bionic people. And how do we analyze baseball when you can have um, bionic eyes installed 10, 15 years from now? Uh, yeah, uh, neural net, neural net's going to be in. You would never know <laughs> it. You know. Well, there you go. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's coming. It's coming. So some of these things, I don't know. I, I'm not sure what, what, how much more you can do about it and how you divide the line between what's this is fair and not. And also to the, the the steroid era players' defense, it wasn't against the rules. I mean, it, baseball has its favorite kinds of cheating. So right. you got folks that are encouraging it, and, and so you do it. You know, I'm not I'm not mad at Greg Vaughn for improving his ability to make money or Mo Vaughn or any of the Vaughns. It's uh, Vaughn Hayes to throw another <laughs> Vaughn. I'm out of Vaughns now. <laughs> Oh, you forgot Van Halen. We go to the Vans, right? <laughs> I'm curious on your guys' thoughts on uh, I'm I'm pro Joe Jackson. He served out the term of his uh, banning because he's been dead fifty plus years. He did not serve. He did not serve out his term. Is it is it he is, forever? He is, it was lifetime. He, he is absolutely not. He is the word is permanent. Permanently permanent. suspended. All right, and that takes you well him. into the grave. <laughs> and beyond obviously yeah, yeah apparently so are we open to having joe jackson come in pete rose come in i mean is that have they done enough or can we are they still permanent i wouldn't drop them in the same bucket because in my mind the betting on your own team is not equivalent to accepting money in the interest of losing games. Um, um, we'll never know exactly what Jackson did, what was going through his mind. We do know that he accepted $5,000 and spent it. Um, and in my mind, that was justified a, a permanent ban. Rose, I'm not so sure about. Yeah, I, I, um, 
I, I agree. There's there's a difference in terms, and and you know, and again, looking at the 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 guys who use steroids, they are attempting to play the game better. But, you know, Rose, <laughs> Rose, phenomenal player, and you know, as a manager, you know, he has his pros and cons. But he wasn't as you know, as Rob is saying, he wasn't you know uh, trying to. Add, <laughs> the last thing Pete Rose was doing was trying ever trying to lose a baseball game he probably would lose lose his arm before he would you know voluntarily lose a lose a baseball game so i i think there is a difference there um, is there though i mean okay let's just believe rose that he only bet on his team to win not that he would ever go the other direction to make up a bet okay we'll say we'll give him that but you also are now affecting that one game and potentially players careers by by going and and placing all of your chips on the table for this one august 3rd game or whatever it is isn't that just as detrimental you know like if your team is going to be compromised the next four games because no, because it's about to... well i mean really you... it's a it's about the integrity of the of the of the of the of the, of the, the sport and yes the, both of those things compromise the integrity but one compromise is actually literally trying to lose. Doesn't that, by definition, compromise the integrity to a much greater degree than maybe altering your chances to win this game relative to this other one that you're also trying to win? Sure. Um, neither of them are good, and certainly a significant punishment was deserved. Uh, I'll give you an example that something I think is more more reasonable. In the NFL, um, the punishment for betting against your own team is a lifetime suspension. The punishment for betting on your own team is one year, which is the punishment that um, Paul Horning, for example, served back in the 1960s, I believe. Um, that seems reasonable to me. Bet on your own team, which is horrible. You're out for a whole year. That's a lot, right? Yeah. Um, but it seems to me that in baseball's, the reason baseball's punishment is so severe for betting on your own team obviously goes back to 1920. That's where it all started. And it seemed like a good idea, idea then, probably was. I'm not sure it makes a great deal of sense in, in a hundred, exactly 100 years later. Well, there's also not a Comiskey not paying you very much money. I mean, not that... true. Misconception, Pete. The oh, White okay, Sox good. were well paid. They were oh, among okay. the best paid players in, in, in all of Major League Baseball. Nice. I've learned something today. All right. Mm -hmm. Reserve clause aside, then. I don't know. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you can complain about the reserve clause, but the White Sox were actually quite well paid if, for people who have seen the movie eight men out and it's a quite a good movie but the rationales offered for the white Sox throwing the world series or the, the black Sox throwing the world series are completely uh concocted somewhat partly by the filmmaker partly by the by the writer who wrote the book the movie was based on but the the story about eddie seacott being screwed out of a bonus because he didn't get a chance to win his 30th game not none of that's true, and the idea that the White Sox were underpaid, not true. Uh, the White Sox getting um, stale champagne for their pennant celebration, not true. It's it's all it, the White Sox Wait, were. That, are you telling me that Hollywood didn't get it right? Not even the great John Sayles, <laughs> wow. correct? Yeah. And no, I know. Also, no one's clamoring for Buck Weaver to get in. It's just uh, it's just Joe, and that's it. Uh, <laughs> yep. Well, it's, just so everybody knows, I, I have no problem with Pete Rose getting in now. He's done enough in my book. And, uh, you know, as intolerable as he can be personally, you know, let the guy have a couple of years as the uh, as the Hall of Fame guy. I'm fine with it. I agreed. Jim, any questions left? Well, I guess, uh, you know, we were talking about, you know, who's going to be on the ballot and, and stuff. What do you guys think of Manny? Manny? Should, should Manny Ramirez be in? He's one of those borderline guys for me. Yeah. Um, if you look at his, I'm going to flip over to baseball reference now. And, and um, I mean, people think he has an overwhelming case. And it's it's quite a good case. He's got a good uh, case. Um, the, you know, if you look at, again, going back to wins above replacement, his, his wins above replacement clearly put him in the middle of that conversation. Um, I would then begin to ask, okay, um, he's at 69 wins above replacement, which, by the way, is almost exactly the same as Scott Rowland. Again, mm -hmm. 
not be all end all with the rubber placement. Um, um, did he help? How much did he hurt or help his teams aside from that raw number I just quoted? Um, was he a great mentor to younger players? I don't know. Well, maybe. Well, that yeah. was he disruptive at times? Absolutely. Did he hurt his teams by being suspended in the middle of seasons and mm. causing the front office to have to scramble to replace him? Yes, he was. So to me, that job, those things drop him into a borderline category with Jeff Field and Todd Helton and Andy Pettit and Bobby Abreu. So I, mm. I'm kind of on the fence with, 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 with him. How about you, Jim? Um, I, I think, I think based on numbers, I think he's, I think he's over the line. Right. And um, in his in his prime, uh, very dangerous. You would just not want to be facing him. And right. um, the other the other baggage is the other baggage. But you know, as we said earlier, you know, the Hall of Fame kind of looks uh, it looks the other way on a lot of that baggage. So I I think he. I, and again, speaking as a Yankee fan, boosting another Boston uh, Red Sox, uh, you know, I think I think he's over the line. I'm not saying that he's a first ballot choice or unanimous choice or anything like that, but I th I think he he was certainly of that era and uh, you know a dangerous hitter in his prime. And I, I used to when I wrote about this stuff daily, I yeah. would spend hours studying every candidate when they arrived on the ballot mm -hmm. and. I haven't done that with Manny because he hasn't been on the ballot for that long. I think if I were a voter, um, he's one of the players, and this is true of most of them, where I would have to do some digging. Mm -hmm. Again, anybody who's just looking at wins above replacement and, and then checking them off the list, whether they clear a certain a certain threshold, I, I, I think that there's a certain amount of art that should come into Hall of Fame voting to a somewhat lesser degree, MVP voting, but really any kind of award voting. Um, if you're just looking at the numbers, th that's the place to start. It's not where I would want to be finishing. And and I, I, I agree with that. And I think that that's one of the things that the baseball writers, you know, to kind of give them a, you know, credit. That's one of the things that they are trying to do directly or indirectly by having people, you know, with a lot of experience because they've actually seen these games and they've seen, you know, the, the, the player and they don't have to just rely on the, um, you know, on the statistics. Right. I'm all for Manny Ramirez being in, and I'll tell you why I think he's over the line in terms of being borderline. There are certain players that make the entire lineup better. There's this misconception that elite players like Sammy Sosa, Barry Bonds, the protection in the lineup, they are the protection. And so when Manny stands in front of you or behind you in the lineup, he makes Big Poppy better. And look, he's great too. I mean, he's going to go in the mm -hmm. Hall of Fame almost for sure. But Manny Ramirez made people two and three batters down the line better because he was always on base. You didn't want to pit, you know, you had to pitch to somebody. Benito Santiago got pitched to because you didn't want to deal with Barry Bonds. And so I think that Manny's one of those players where Sheffield as well, where they were so dangerous and they were able to get on base so much that, you know, that they made their team better, at least in their immediate orbit in terms of the lineup. So I, I think Manny comes over that line. He comes with a lot of baggage, of course, and, you know, but he was so incredible at the plate that I think all the other stuff is sort of is sort of secondary. But it does make me think about with all the first basemen that are there and the sluggers who live in left field because they don't do much else. We're definitely missing value in other players. Like I'm not saying that Carlos Baerga should be a Hall of Famer, but maybe second basemen are just not as likely to have a 20 year career because of the the position or whatever. And we don't give credit for that loss. Yeah. Value. yeah. Well, what about, you know you mentioned the guy earlier, Pete. You mentioned Kenny Lofton. Yeah. Kenny Lofton mm -hmm. was a really good player for a long time. Um, you know, uh, similar to Lou Whitaker, a really good player for a long time. And neither of them ever won MVP, MVP awards or even came close, although they probably came a lot closer than Omar Vizquel. <clears throat> but um, because they didn't have those hooks, right? Lofton doesn't have a hook. Yeah. Whitaker doesn't really, yeah. except for right. being with Trammell forever. And they just get left behind. And it's it's really a shame. Um, and I would agree with you, you're right? We just forget about, and especially if a player's value comes from a broad base of skills, 
which was true of Whitaker and, and Lofton both, they just get forgotten, and it's it's terribly unfair. Yeah. Good point. Well, I don't want to keep you guys all day. Anything you guys want to say in closing at all? I, I had so many thoughts. Jim, go ahead. You go first. <laughs> No, that, that's okay. I've already uh, – there's enough places I can't go now. So, <laughs> Well, how about this? I'll ask you a final question, Jim. Giancarlo Stanton started early, crushes the ball hard, has MVPs. Is he going to make the Hall of Fame? Is he going to make the Hall of Fame? Of course yeah. he's going to make the Hall of Fame because he's going to lead the Yankees to uh, 10 more uh, World Series victories. <laughs> hey, in, Jim, here's a question incredible for you. Series, incredible who, series. who led the Yankees in home runs last season? Uh, Luke. Luke, Luke, uh, you know, well, that's not really what we're talking about, but an incredible, uh, you know, player who seemingly came from nowhere, but, you know, between, uh, the sc you know, Yankee scouting and, you know, coaching and obviously his, uh, you know, his work ethic and, and everything that he did, uh, just his career just totally blossomed. Uh, and maybe that's, you know, getting back to where we started, you know, maybe hopefully there's going to still be room for, for those guys in, you know, leagues other than those that are controlled by MLB. I think for the most part, the talent, even if MLB misses it in the draft or they aren't signed as free agents out of college or high school, they, most of that talent will rise mm -hmm. because there will be so much baseball being played all the same places that we're seeing it now and maybe even and probably more places baseball is actually a, believe it or not um is a growth industry um mm. uh so i i think the talent pipeline will still be there and most of the same players will rise through it it might not be as efficient as it as it once was but um i, I actually don't think we're gonna lose a lot of talent um in, in especially as people start paying even more attention to concussions. Um, I think that mm. we'll have more talent, not less playing baseball and rising up and showing up in major league ballparks. That concussion, you know, we talk about traumatic brain injuries, you know, there's also brain injuries and that you're right. It's such a big part of things. People are not going to want their kids to play hockey and football as much as they used to. And soccer oh. even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a guy who's a, a specialist in recovering from brain injuries, a doctor, and he's like, I only do chest traps now. I never had the ball anymore because he knows what happens to a brain from heading the ball, you know? Wow. Yep. Um, I just want to say thanks to you guys. Everybody should go check out Rob's books on Amazon. The link is on the page. If you're on the podcast side, you can definitely get the link in there. Support Rob's writing. It's so entertaining. He's done it for so long, and you're so great at it, Rob. Thank you, thank you, thank you for what you're thanks, doing. Thanks, Pete. Appreciate that. Yeah, and you know, Jim happens to be an incredible author too. I, I, um, I was thinking about reading West like lightning again. I want to recommend that book to Rob. It's so good. It's his story of the pony express. You guys can same thing. There's the link to Jim's books. He's written, I don't know, 50 plus books, including American sniper and code named Johnny Walker, my buddy, Johnny Walker. So again, two incredible authors definitely support these guys buy their books and then we'll have them come back on the show whenever they have a new one come out. Thank you. Great fellas. to see you guys. Thanks. Thanks. Great to be on. Thank you. All right. I'm signing.